This is a review and a follow-up of our hacked Starlink after a trip to Australia, a very remote uh, trip to Australia. Hi folks, I'm Roger from Offgrid, and uh, in this episode I'm going to take you through uh, what our experience was with our hacked Starlink, how useful it was, uh, challenges that we faced, uh, things that worked and didn't work, and just a general chat about it. The first thing to note, you'll see we've got <laughs> this uh, duct tape here. And you're not going to believe this, but when I checked this Perspex, I could not find that little acrylic layer on it or that little... No, that, that stuff is acrylic. It's, okay. It's a when, it. when I checked the acrylic, the Perspex, I couldn't find that little protective sheet. I sort of pulled on it and pulled on it and tugged and uh, I couldn't, so I thought, okay, it's not on here. So I psychoflexed the base to the, uh, the case here and off we went and of course <laughs> it came off and uh, we had to make a plan. So we basically cut it down to the shape of the actual dish because it was a bit bigger because I'd wanted it to be bigger deliberately so that I could uh, use that as a basis to mount it on top of my motorhome. So we cut it down and then uh, used uh, duct tape which we borrowed from our friends in Australia to duct tape this on. So it looks really rough and ready and I suppose it is that but it actually worked pretty well. So this was the final dish that we went all the way to Arnhem Land, uh, a very, very remote place in Australia. We actually went to uh, two locations on the trip. Uh, one uh, where we stayed uh, pretty much with an Aboriginal community, really, really nice bunch of guys, and really enjoyed that part of the trip. And then we went to an extremely remote location. And uh, uh, in a nutshell, this was an absolute lifesaver. Without this, we couldn't have done the trip because uh, the business needs us to be online and most evenings we'd spend half an hour or so answering emails and uh, chatting to people. We did a number of uh, Skype calls. For the most part, they were pretty good. The most exciting uh, use of the Starling dish over the whole trip was actually when we had an emergency medical situation. Uh, there was a problem in camp with somebody and we needed to call in the flying doctors and uh, the the dish was absolutely invaluable. We we also, all of us had in-reach systems, if you know what that is. That's a Garmin solution where you've got a little device that you can basically text in and out using the satellite system. So that was there as a standby, but actually Starlink was uh, pretty good uh, in terms of us being able to talk to the emergency services and uh, send photos and things like that. So it, it was really handy uh, to be able to do that with Starlink. So. Uh, pretty much a lifesaver for us, so uh, very pleased with what we could do with the dish. On the whole, very, very positive experience. So uh, we would set it up, it would take a while and uh, connect, and uh, we, the whole camp, we tried not to sort of reduce the, the effect, the impact that we were remote camping, but the guys liked to just check in with their wives or uh, various people and, and Nigel and I needed to check in with the business and make sure that everything was going okay. So, and this was absolutely invaluable. So we would limit the amount of time that we spent in the evening, uh, but it was really, really a, a great thing for the whole, the, the whole troop, if you like, the, 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 all the guys in the camp to be able to get online and just check that everything was okay. The whole idea when you camp in Australia is that you find the best shade possible. Now, Obviously, if you've been to Australia, you'll know that uh, about 90% of the trees are eucalyptus and with a few other species here and there. Uh, the eucalyptus don't show, don't throw terribly good shade, but they do interfere incredibly with the starling comms. So one of the challenges we found was to, to get this dish to a location where it could get a decent signal. Uh, we, we did that more or less. Sometimes the signal would drop mid-call and that sort of thing, but on the whole uh, we did not manage to get that to a, a good location and to be able to get online effectively. The solution itself in terms of how we modified everything uh, worked pretty well and I'm going to go through a few details of this which may help some people uh, think of doing this sort of thing in the future. So obviously we were trying to get this dish as lightweight as possible and to use as little power as possible. Those were the two most important criteria. Uh, literally this thing was in my hand luggage. We were a bit nervous to put it in the hand luggage going over in case it got confiscated because we had a, had a connecting flight in Singapore 
But, and we've had like batteries confiscated in the past. And so we were a little bit nervous that this would be confiscated uh, if it was in our hand luggage. So we sent it through in the main luggage, but on the return trip where it, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been nice, but not a train smash if it was confiscated. Uh, I actually literally carried this thing in my hand luggage and it was absolutely fine. Uh, they questioned all sorts of other things going through the scanners, but funnily enough, this thing d wasn't questioned once going through, I think, three different uh, sets of scanners. So in the airports, that was quite all right. We found this uh, solution, this 12 volt solution, uh, worked pretty well. So this cable with SEA, I think this is one and a half mil cable, 10 meters long. Uh, this worked really well to power the dish. Uh, we, we used the splitter and obviously your usual crocodile lead, so, so this going to the splitter and then uh, going off to there. And this worked pretty well going on to the car battery. Uh, once or twice we used the, uh, the cigarette lighter solution, so this also worked uh, pretty well. When these were all plugged into a battery that was reasonably well charged, it worked absolutely brilliantly. Where we came short was uh, on one occasion we uh, we didn't know that the auxiliary battery in one of the vehicles was actually not working, so it was down to about 8 volts, and uh, we used the crocodile clips to go onto that, and that obviously didn't work. So at, one, at the, um, the first campsite we were at, they, they had some solar solution there. The Aboriginal community had a solar solution. And after that day with the medical emergency, uh, we were running really low on, on the battery and probably starting to get to the point where we could damage it. So we decided, we asked them if we could plug into their power source, which we did. And we had one of those uh, converters to converting, uh, you know, mains AC power to uh, 12 volt DC. And we found that the dish would not actually boot under those circumstances. When we measured the voltage, so we actually put a splitter right here at the dish to see what the voltage was after the 10 meter cable. When we measured the voltage here, it was about 12.2. And what would happen is this would go into a booting phase and, and never get out of the booting phase. So we were a little bit worried that if we left it indefinitely that it would burn something out because we've read and heard about dishes burning out. So we stopped that process. And then the battery that we were running it off most of the time got fairly low on one occasion. Uh, so sort of 12.1-ish and this thing then stopped booting. So in our particular case, this dish does not operate on any voltage less than 12.2. It's gotta be more than 12.2 for this thing to boot up properly. I don't know if that's normal. I don't know if it's the way I've converted it or if it's all dishes or just this dish, but uh, from what I've read, and I might contact one or two people to get an answer, from what I've read, it should still boot up even sort of nine, 10 volts, it should, should still boot up, but in our case, definitely below 12.2, it would not boot up. It would be absolutely fine with lithium batteries, because as you know, their voltage is slightly higher, but with lead acids or AGMs or gels, and this was a, a um, AGM battery, uh, you need to have the battery reasonably full for this thing to operate properly. Um, so that was one thing that we found out, interestingly. We tried to use this low power uh, Vonnet's um, wireless access point, this router and wireless access point, and, and apart from the difficulty of setting it up, well in addition to the difficulty of actually setting it up, we found it, it's, the range was very limited. You had to be within about 10 meters of it for it to actually work. So it made it difficult to work in camp. So we used, we used this uh, router wireless access point for the majority of the trip. And this worked pretty well, actually. And uh, so quite pleased with how this was. The only problem was that the dish uses uh, on standby just about two amps, one and a half, two amps on standby goes to three or four when you're really pumping data through. But this thing would use another two or three amps of power. So that was a, a bit of an issue that it actually used that much power just to run the two. When we were running both of them together, we were, we were running anywhere sort of between three and five amps that it was using up. So taking a fair amount of battery power and, and I yeah, if, if you were close to the router, you could use this, which would drop it down. But I'm just mentioning all of this because one of our sort of primary directives was to get this thing to be as low power consuming as we possibly could. So, but that worked fine. Using this router worked absolutely treat. So I, I would highly recommend 
uh, this particular router and we'll put a link down below so that you can uh, get hold of it if you want to. Uh, if you are going to be really close, uh, this router is not a bad one to have, uh, but as I said, it, it's only 2.4 gigahertz, uh, whereas this is 2 and 5, and so um, more versatile for modern phones and things like that. The last point I would make, this cable was, was great for the circumstances, but obviously being a flat cable, when we try to put it into this protector, it doesn't really work for a for a flat cable like this. So we just wound a little bit of tape over this to, to make sure that this would be protected. But if you are wanting to uh, secure it from water ingress completely, then you would need to use a RAN cable. So if you're mounting it on a motorhome or something like that, don't go for a flat cable like this. Go for a RAN cable that you can pass through these little glands and secure properly. I, I was surprised that this router ran off the 2.4 amp USB but it did, and so that was a good thing. So on, on the whole, very, very pleased with how this worked. Uh, I would uh, do the conversion again in a flash, but this I'm going to put a proper base on now and uh, psychoflex it so it doesn't come off again, and uh, do it in such a way that it can be mounted at a slight angle and put it on top of my motorhome roof, and then it'll possibly stay there indefinitely, or we'll whip it down for the next Australian trip or wherever it is that we go to. But yeah, uh, well pleased with it. And uh, in terms of a really lightweight, low power consuming, uh, very effective uh, method to stay online and in touch with loved ones and the business, I would say this was a, a really, really good decision that we made. And uh, we absolutely loved the trip. I think Nigel will probably post a, a, a pic at the end of this to show you just where we were camped and what it looked like. We had uh, two Toyota Hiluxes in an extremely remote area and it was great, really great. So thanks for watching and hopefully this will inspire you to to your own conversion and go out there and have a little bit of fun. This is a real game changer for extreme remote camping. Yeah, see you in the next episode.